<laughs> you probably just through my microphone. Hey, welcome, friends. We uh, we just realized it said unmute on the screen, so you missed out all that lovely dialogue that we had there. But hopefully, you can hear us now. So that's just a wonderful that's thing. Funny. <laughs> so. Uh, we are enjoying another day in Indiana. Uh, you've had plenty of time in the silence to enjoy the disclaimers. And keep in mind, assets fluctuate in value. And so uh, I've noticed on Zillow, I follow just regular places. And a year ago, if you didn't uh, buy the property without seeing it, it was going to be another twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in the central Indiana area where, where we live. But uh, I've noticed on that same search, they're dropping by 10 or $20,000 in a whack now. Really? And, and so there's um, there's uh, no safe asset out there. Uh, in case you were wondering, there's just a reality that your assets fluctuate in price. And that's our desire is to help you manage those really to the best of your ability and uh, offer uh, insight to you in, in changing and uncertain times. Supposedly, the price of a new Tesla is fluctuating in price. I, I haven't confirmed this, but it's it's something that I've seen on, on a few of my friends' Twitter posts. What I read, it's weird that I have like this random knowledge in the squash of mine, but what I read is that a high percentage of the Tesla purchases in August were by people who are flipping Teslas. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. And, yeah. and so it, it's kind of like uh, when you have a real estate bubble, people are buying more real yeah. estate than they should have. And so Tesla um, will have to find the the reality of where Tesla prices should be. And so if you happen to own a lot of Teslas right now, you, yeah. might, you, might, you might let somebody else have some of those, even if you cut your losses. Don't, you don't want to be the last one holding the bag on a on a te on a used tesla whoever thought you could make money on used cars right like, right like that's Seriously. crazy that's yeah. crazy to i mean that. how long ago was it that we had the cash for clunkers yeah was that in the 09 2010 yeah. And, yeah and now we've had just runaway used cars prices i mean one of our anchor articles last year was talking about don't give your um lease car back because you can make more right. money paying it off than selling it and uh, that probably will be changing in the days ahead, probably because of the um, the M2 is the measure of cash out there and the reduction in cash available is happening pretty quickly. And when you have cash, less cash in the economy, you have less demand on assets, less demand on assets puts downward pressure on those. If you want to see a picture of that, by the way, uh, you can just Google Fred M2 and it it should pop up. It's it's kind of cool. Do you want me to do that for you, then? Yeah. I'm a high tech kind of guy, so yeah. Um, Fred, we've looked at this a couple of times on our weekly show here, and uh, the chart on the Fred site is this one? Yeah, here? I think that's it. Yeah, there it is. All right, sure. All right, what do you want to tell us about this, Doug? Yeah, I mean, check it out at. 2020, right at the COVID mark, just the escalation of the amount of money that was out there shot through the roof. And like you pointed out, starting to trail off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we, we were talking cash for clunkers was right around here, right? This recession. And yeah. so we were at, was that 8 trillion? Is that 8,000 billion? Is that $8 trillion? Is that what that is? You do the math. Yeah. <laughs> so then it got all the way up here to uh, 22 in less than a decade, which it didn't do. It didn't do anything like that. Yeah, like its whole life. Right. So uh, free flowing cash is inflationary. And, and ironically, the Federal Reserve's kept blaming a lot of other things. They, they were say, they were telling us that um, inflation was transitory, probably right over here after Supply that. Supply chain. They were blaming everything else other than the printing press. Right. I, I started watching a Netflix show this week. Um, and Netflix had a good day the other day. It did. They announced good earnings. So that's today, I think. Even I haven't looked at it, but uh, it's called the, uh, what's this thing called? The 
high, maybe it's called the heist or the money, the money heist. I think what, you're allowed to make a, a Netflix recommendation. You're just not allowed to make a stock recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what, well, anyway, the, 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 why I was mentioning this thing, I'm not endorsing this show. It's kind of interesting, but the, the premise behind it is they're going to, these guys are going to make a heist and they decided we'll go to Spain's printing presses and, um, uh, Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, instead of just running the printing presses and stealing money from me, these guys are actually going in and printing the paper and taking the cash. So, so you can you can steal money from people either by going into the printing presses or by turning them on. And inflation is just a tax. It is not something that you and I did. It's the leadership that did that. So anyway, that's enough of that. So what else you got on your mind, Doug? Well, the stock market. I, this this has been uh, golly. I mean, it's, it's this was a four day week, right? <laughs> it's it seemed like it was a full week uh, in the marketplace, and so Keats popped up the S and P five hundred index as uh, a collection of five hundred stocks that represent what's happening in the stock market. These are global companies; they're doing business everywhere. They've got accounting departments out the yin-yang that are trying to figure out uh, spread differences in currencies. But as you can see, um, we rallied up again to the black line, the 200, and then came back down. And it's the same story that happened in the summertime, that happened, when is that, back in uh, around the first of last year? I mean, it's just it's just been amazing how prices have rallied up to that 200 and then reversed. So we we really began in the in the S and P 500 this bear market that we're in started right early January last year and right here's the 50 day moving average for our new viewers and this black line is the 200 day basically 50 days is one quarter of the stock market 200 days is a year of the stock market it takes each of these lines that are a day's trading activity in that particular index and it averages those out so you can as our friend patrick says you could throw this thing on the floor and look at the angle of it and decide whether you're in a bear or bull market and and the the 200 day cannot mathematically turn downwards without the 50-day moving average turning down first and so it started turning down way over here while we we're still hitting a new high right there on the 200-day moving average and it crossed below the 200-day here in March of last year and the 50-day has never come back above it and the 200-day then is now trending downwards and like you said Doug it it rallied up to it here in April last year, couldn't hold it more than a week or so, then just plummeted through there, rallied back up in August, uh, dropped off, and then we hit it briefly in Thanksgiving time frame and Christmas, dropped down a little bit, and uh, these, these three days of volume are just really kind of interesting down here is that they have picked up over the last week it was looking really good when we were meeting with uh, you guys or i wasn't with you last, last week but. last friday was looking great i mean as you can see those those blue lines were ticking up it was really looking good but interesting thing to me about the the 200 day on this picture is we just keep lowering it yeah the price is lower the 200 days just math but the hurdle keeps coming down and we can't clear it and so uh, kind of like earnings estimate revisions, um, you know, analysts try and predict what a stock or what a company might earn in a given year. And we went through a long stretch from like 2009 to 2020, where analysts kept increasing the height of the hurdle, the height of the earnings expectations. And companies were jumping over them, like every quarter, just clearing them, not even nicking their heels just clearing them so we keep lowering the the hurdle of the 200 day and we can't clear it well and really that if you're all in the market then that's a pessimistic thing for us i think that's an optimistic thing it is because there's going to be a day when everybody is so pessimistic yeah. that they're giving things away and that should be a really good buying opportunity. It may be really close. We don't know. We were really hopeful. I think both you and I were hopeful this yeah. last week or so. 
Uh, I, I was looking at some data. I'm going to have to put on these readers. I'm sorry, fans. <laughs> that the um, uh, the first five trading days in 2023 um, were up. I think. Where is it here? Uh, 1.37 percent, and that's significantly higher than most of the first five trading days. There's a thing people call the January effect, and sometimes. It's as January goes, so goes the market that year. And so, so far, um, January is uh, still up, right? So we're, we're yeah. still up for January. So that's optimistic for the year. And and when the first five days are up more than 1%, historically, um, you've had a, an average on those years of almost 14% return. Uh, but that's just a data point. That's not guarantees. And the other data point to mix with that is when when you have those first few days up, seventy nine percent of time, seventy nine percent of the time you have positive returns for the year, which means twenty one percent of the time you don't. Yeah. So you can't just blindly go in and buy because January was up. I took myself out for breakfast this morning. Me and uh, the uh, stock almanac that you gave me. We had, we had eggs and bacon this morning and. And I was reading the exact same thing. I wanted to go back and I wanted to see, okay, what does the January effect tell me? And, and that was exactly it is, you know, yes, the percentages are pretty high in our favor right now, but uh, just like the used Tesla, you don't want to be the last one holding the bag in case it goes the other way. And, and that's why having to stop discipline is so important. I wonder too, like I didn't crunch this data down further. I wonder how that data is impacted if you're in a bear market going into January and and trending down like we are. I don't know what that what they probably somebody probably has I'm that sure data. That's out there. Yeah. yeah. And and you know when this thing turns around, we're going to be ready to be some of the biggest cheerleaders. I think so. Yeah. And it seems like it's getting closer. <laughs> Who knows? I thought it would have been last week. <laughs> well, we'll see. Well. We'll give it another week. We'll, we'll have a, a new opinion over this. But I, really what our friend Mark Minervini taught us is what we like to see is uh, volatility contraction pattern, VCP is what he calls it. And so you have this, it, it kind of zigzags. And, and when you have this zigzagging like this, you like to get, you like to see what's going on. That? I am not. You want me to share that? <laughs> Thanks, Doug. <laughs> so... So this is uh, the VCP is where you have the volatility. It drops off like it did here, rallies up, uh, drops off not quite as much. This hit a lower low, but it's not as big of a percentage drop as the one before. We rallied up, dropped off here. If it can hold this and maybe give us a, you know, even a little more tightening on this, it, it, you know, who knows what. And that's second. basically just shaking out the weak hands. Yeah. And, yeah. and so... <laughs> It seems like we're at the weakest of hands, maybe even right now, um, or, or the strongest of the weak hands, maybe right now. I don't know. Uh, but I haven't heard anybody like saying, hey, buy on the dip, or this is great. You know, I don't hear that type of language anymore. Yeah, it's... Uh... Instead, it's like, ugh. <laughs> Right, the stock I, market's I, terrible. I mean, when I start hearing the stock market's terrible, that's a great thing. Like Warren Buffett, what was his quote? Uh, it's when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. Is yeah, that, is that or, or be greedy when others oh, are yeah. fearful. <laughs> you know, I mean, and so it's, you know, we're starting to see stuff like that. Well, it uh, it's good. It's good for the long haul. It's good for investors like us. And um, I was looking for these, these uh, symbols. I wanted to pop up here real quick. Um, this just gives us a pulse beyond what we just showed you. Um, why even in the midst of this, we can hear that. We can be a little more optimistic, and um, the uh, this is a lot of information for y'all. But this this is the New York Stock Exchange, and it shows you the ten day moving average of up volume in blue versus down volume in red, or whatever color that is. And what that means is every day there's millions and millions of shares traded. They're taking the ones that the stock ended down, and and quantifying that they're taking the stocks that the stock ended up and so if it ended up it would be a blue if it ended down it would be red but they're taking the amount of volume that's trading on that to give you a running average to tell you just what people are doing probably more institutions than you and i out on our personal accounts and so 
what we've seen is that you know we've had this uh, down volume leading for a lot of uh, the time in the last year, and and you can see we had a little bit of a rally in the fourth quarter, and then it dropped off, and then then up volume was or down volume was leading for a while. But as we started the new year, we we got a glimmer of hope that yeah. there's some buyers coming in there. Um, then this is a 10 day moving average of new highs versus new lows. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, the new highs have finally started working their way greater than the new lows. That's the New York Stock Exchange, um, the NASDAQ, which is some of your tech stocks, uh, which I got to get in here, uh, gives you a little of the same flavor, but a little bit different. Um, the the up volume rallied off of there for a while. And, and now you see both of them, just like on the last one, turning down a little bit. And here's the new highs and the new lows that are, again, the new highs are kind of getting there a little bit on the on the NASDAQ stock. So anything on these two, Doug? That... No, I think you summed it up. Uh, yeah, last, last week's optimism looks like it's turning a little bit. Yeah, and, and who knows? It, it could just be a, a natural reaction to the market that we've seen the last few I days. I think it and, is. Yeah, and yeah. So, so we'll see. We, we remain optimistic, and uh, we'll continue uh, keeping our eyes open for you. Yeah. I got uh, something non-stock related, uh, but uh, bond related. Is Look, that exciting? Let's go bonds. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just looking at the uh, 10-year Treasury and basically the federal government will make deals, uh, loan deals with with big banks, <clears throat> and uh, you can buy these things. Uh, you can buy them in the secondary market, and they'll go up and down in price. You'll hear their yields quoted on uh, your drive home or uh, on whatever TV show you like to watch at night. But um, something interesting on the ten year Treasury. The ten-year Treasury, uh, you know, as of yesterday, was like three point three seven percent, and so that type of yield, for the first time in a long time, stocks have competition uh, with it with a rate that's backed by the government. And uh, just going back in time, as we like to do, uh, last year this time, it wasn't paying three point three seven; it was paying one point eight seven. And then uh, we go back in time to March 9th of 2020, and the 10 year was paying 0 0.54, 0 0.54. Then you go back in time a little bit more to April of 2000, and it was paying 6.23. And so <clears throat> what we're experiencing right now, this, this, this kind of like that boost in yield, uh, 337 sounds really great for a lot of people, but historically it, it's even low. And, and so what this tells me is, is that we're returning to uh, some normalcy and to how a 10-year treasury rate might look. And so for some of you who are really good savers, uh, you finally get to be rewarded for some of your savings. And, and I am so happy for you because I know we serve a lot of really great savers. And um, for you to get some money, uh, interest on your money markets or some interest in your checking account or CDs, um, that's great for your safe money, for your emergency funds, uh, for your you know one, three-year plans, shorter-term plans. It's it's good to see, but it, it's probably going to hang out here for a little while is what this tells me. Yeah, I, um, I might have mentioned this a few weeks ago that 3% was the savings rate when I was a kid. Um, and I, I thought that was low as a kid. I, that's, I was like, oh, it seemed like they should pay me more. But um, that 3% range is where a lot of savings accounts or money markets are now. I've talked to a number of clients in the last couple of weeks that they are not getting that at their savings institution. They're still getting below half a percent. And, and so if you are a saver and you get, you get your statement, you might take a look at that. And it, I don't really advocate changing banks for things very often, but if you aren't getting much, they're, they're, they're earning it. That's whether or not they're paying it out is a thing. So you might go into the branch and talk to them and see why you're not getting any more than you are and 
maybe look at some one or two year CDs as a possibility. Those might be closer to three to four percent range. It's hard to know based on each institution. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's the exciting world of treasury bonds. Gotta love it. <laughs> Gotta love it. Yeah. And uh uh counterintuitively, you know, I th think we barked about it in our newsletter about how it didn't make any sense for negative interest rates right. when everybody was doing that. And and so yeah, um, this seems to make more sense with the Fed printing money and interest rates where they are right now. It seems pretty reasonable to to be there. So, um, I had uh, I had some notes on some. Uh, they called this thing when the, what was it? One point seven trillion dollars the the government approved to spend back right around Christmas break. Yeah, and they call it the CARES Act, CARES Act two or something. The I don't care is that I, <laughs> the friends and family uh, benefits act for the government. I don't know what you call it, but uh, there's some things that um, probably are worthwhile to you that are have retirement accounts. Uh, if you were born 1949 or before, um, you should be taking required distributions. It, it was at age 72 is what it was. Starting this year, the CARES Act set the required minimum distribution to um, age 73, which means if you were born 1950 or, or after, that's what your required minimum dis distribution beginning date will be. Uh, and that's going to work its way up to age 75 in 2033. I don't think we need to harp on that today. Uh, cynically, I noticed in the notes that in the past, if you didn't take out the amount you were required to take out, there was a so-called 50% penalty of the amount the variance between what you took out and what you were supposed to take out. There's 50% penalty. Never heard of anybody. Have you ever heard of anybody paying that? I haven't. Yeah. And so the, the, the wording of this acts as though they're being gracious right. because they lowered that penalty from 50% to 25%. But what they, what they added in that is that, it, Hey, if you self-regulate and you turn yourself in and, you know, you do it in a timely manner, we're only going to charge you 10%. Well, yeah. That may be a tax increase if they if they enforce yeah, that ten percent. Yeah. So uh, that that to me is a age discrimination by our federal government because as you get older, the ability to do these calculations don't get easier and easier. And that's usually somebody that's maybe uh, elderly is having a hard time getting those done. If you've got your assets with us, if you consolidate them here, that's something we can do that for you, and we we monitor that every year. To make sure we get that done in a proper manner for you. Um, the um, saw something else about this. Uh, I, I think the four hundred one k side is pretty interesting about this. You're, you're talking about the fact that prior to this, your Roth four hundred one k had to have a, a required minimum distribution and no longer. Yeah, and even the the responsibility of, of the company and the company match on the on the four hundred one k side. There are some changes. There are some changes to the catch-up provisions, and so they sound good, but it's also a way for the government to get uh, access to some of your capital right now and tax you right now on some of the Roth-type contributions. Yeah, yeah, it, it's that that uh, was pretty convoluted. It's pretty it, slick. I yeah, thought. yeah, yeah. It's uh, um, pretty interesting. The other thing. And those of you that have this, we'll, we'll be working with you throughout 2023 because I don't think we've done anything yet, is if you have a, a beneficiary IRA and it's one that required eligible designated beneficiaries, and I forget which tax year that happened. 20, I believe. 2020. So yeah. prior to that, if you had a beneficiary IRA, you could take it out over your life expectancy. Uh, now it's a 10 year period. You have to have it out of there was the way it was explained when they made that tax law change in 2020. And they put out IRS publication 2022-53. If you've got a, a beneficiary IRA and you're concerned about it, you can read the details. Conceptually, what they're saying is you have to take some of it out each of the 10 years, and it all has to be out by the end of the 10th year. Uh, and they don't have an explanation for what they're going to do for tax years 2021 and 2022 when there was no stated required distribution. Right. Um, I'm guessing, my opinion is, I'm guessing that these 87,000 uh, IRS agents that they're hiring won't even understand that this is I, a thing. I've Googled this I don't know how many times. 
and I'm sure you have too. And, the, and there's just a real lack of clarity. Even if you Google the question, do I have to take out, you know, uh, beneficiary RMD money right now? Do I have to wait 10 years? And I think what you'll see is, is you'll see you've got 10 years to take it out, but they don't talk about taking out a little bit each year. Hmm. And so there's just been a lack of clarity from the IRS. Right, right. Man, what else you got going on, Doug, that we need to discuss today? I think that's it for me. I, I always enjoy walking through the stock market with everyone. And then I appreciate the questions I've been getting throughout the week on the market. Um, I guess first and foremost, and uh, we've talked about this before, is just um, on the on the mental side of, of capital. I want to encourage everybody uh, when, when we're experiencing times like these, just to uh, really protect the, the mental side of your capital. And um uh, talking it out with me or Keith may be of, of help and just get a picture of where your money is and how you're doing and what you're using it for, what you hope to use it for. I uh, want to encourage you to keep living. Well, and I'd even add to that, Doug, that last week I haven't had a chance to see the show, but you introduced our new advisor, Phil. So if we don't happen to be available, Phil's got a pretty good opinion as well. So there's an extra um, set of ears and eyes to yeah. chat through with that. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys can watch football this weekend, but I, I discovered that last week was Tom Brady's 48 um, uh, playoff game. It's impressive. And I, I've kind of, it's impressive. I've become a Tom Brady fan. I, yeah. I don't know how much longer. I respect him. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. but he has played more games in playoffs than the average NFL player's career last. Yeah. That's crazy. That's, that's impressive. It is crazy. Yeah. So you guys can uh, make the most out of your time. You can make your career last as long as you want. You can help people, bless people, and encourage people. And I'd say in the gray days of Indiana today, today's a good day to encourage somebody across your path. You could even switch teams and go to one in Florida. <laughs> go <laughs> to a nicer, sunnier location. That's right. Well, I hope everybody has a great weekend. I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Bye.